So. And you, you mentioned, you kind of touched upon it a little briefly, I think, to try and make this uh, a little easier, say like a, a graduate student who's just starting to get into bioprinting or 3D yeah. printing in general, you mentioned retraction. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that? Because that is yes. immensely important and, and what systems can and cannot do that very well and why? Of course. When you are extruding a viscous fluid or a paste or just a bio ink, out of a small needle, most needles are small, um, it's tough. And oftentimes you press really hard on that fluid in the syringe and it kind of just slowly comes out of the needle. And uh, I'd say about 90% of the examples of bioprinting I've seen where they were doing this, there were bubbles in the syringe. And what happens is, is if you press on the ink with the bubbles in it, the bubbles compress and they store energy like a spring. And the ink just kind of like slowly comes out of the nozzle. When you remove pressure from the back of the syringe, if it's an air pressure driven extruder, the bubbles can keep that pressure stored like a spring, right? And they can continue to make ink ooze. And so pneumatic extruders that just vent their pressure to atmosphere and stop extrusion oftentimes kind of ooze or they leak as especially if they're moving from one area where they're extruding to another they might leave like a little dribble or drool or something between the, the spots a mechanical extruder is capable of pulling the piston backwards and i know it's possible with pneumatic extruders to put a vacuum but very few do it right i actually haven't seen i think more than one of all the bioprinters that's capable of doing it and it's hard to tune Back to mechanical design. Mechanical design is capable of pulling the plunger back, which can pull on the ink, and if it has bubbles, the bubbles, and basically exert a negative or a decreased pressure on this material. That can stop extrusion. And when you're doing small details in a print, going back and forth, printing little bits at a time, little islands, you don't want to leak a lot between those islands. And you also don't want to leak on the island because it, it'll screw the, the, the actual printing path there up. And so you want to be able to stop extrusion, and that's why you need retraction. And retraction really works well on mechani mechanical extruders. Not all mechanical extruders. You have to design these mechanical extruders well. Like a syringe pump is actually a very poor, when I say syringe pump, I mean like an infusion style syringe pump where you know it's sitting on the table. Yeah, it's really like CT injection. syringe sitting on top of it. Yeah. What? It's like for a CT contrast injection or something like that, where it's just exactly, direct, like medical, pushes down on a plunger and that's pump. it. Um, exactly. Th Those th are not designed well for this. Right. Um, I think a, a way that I really like to uh, have people envision retraction who are just getting into 3D printing is if you've ever used a hot glue gun, for example, when you're doing arts and crafts <laughs> in kindergarten, and you put a little bit of hot glue gun, or uh, the hot glue over here, and then the second that you lift up that hot glue gun, there's always that like that silken thread kind of almost like spider silk that gets pulled off the tip. Um, that's basically what you do not want in a 3D print. And a way that you can effectively, as you're saying, avoid that is if right when you're done squeezing the hot glue gun, if you were to pull back on that glue stick a little bit, you would return material back up into the nozzle so you wouldn't get that stringing. Exactly. And when you're doing hundreds or tens of thousands, depending on your print, of these travel paths from A to B um, to C, and if you're having that little amount of, of stringing between them, you're really basically contaminating your print with material that shouldn't be there. And right. in the, going forward with bioprinting in general, if you're trying to print tiny, tiny tunnel networks, basically like vasculature system, you can't really afford to have stuff inside those tubes or anything else. Like you just don't want exactly. anything other than what the computer has calculated from your model, um, which is why I think our lab really likes using mechanically driven extruders. And you can get nice pneumatic ones, but they cost so much, they add a compressor and weight to your printer, and they add noise. And they also are not consistent throughout the entire volume of a syringe. So mm -hmm. as you go from a full syringe to a, to a nearly empty syringe, if you're driving it with the same pressure, you'll actually get different flow rates out the nozzle. Right. Uh, whereas a mechanical syringe pump extruder relies on a direct displacement principle yes, or direct drive positive displacement principle. And also for those that are interested, this concept of avoiding these hairs, these, these oozing bits, 
in 3D printing, desktop 3D printing or thermoplastic 3D printing, this is generally just called stringing. And on those desktop 3D printers, stringing is avoided with retraction. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think what you're, you're going off there with desktop 3D printers is when, when anyone joins our lab or anyone trying to get into yeah. 3D bioprinting, we do not recommend anyone just starts bioprinting. Back when I was educating you guys mm -hmm. at the very beginning, um, actually you were one of the only people I ever taught that had any sort of bioprinting background. You came in without plastic 3D printing. Yeah. You knew bioprinting from a lab you worked in. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I had every single person that came in do plastic printing first because the principles of plastic printing apply directly to most of the printing we do. There are just some strange settings that you change, like the filament for, is just the syringe instead, but to your point, right. whenever we have anyone join our lab, we basically try and put them through a plastic printing boot camp. Right. And anyone trying to get into bioprinting that is a really nice way to learn a lot of really fundamental skills that will translate almost perfectly to bioprinting. Number one would be CAD experience of learning how to make parts. Because even if you don't get into bioprinting, learning how to 3D print plastic parts for your research, it's, it's beyond mandatory <laughs> in my head, where I really can't think of anyone in our lab who, who has a physical lab space who should not have a 3D printer. If you're a mathematics professor and you're just writing on a whiteboard all day, by all means. But anyone with a physical lab space nowadays really should have a plastic printer to print all these, we, we say the word jig so many times in lab, it's, it's kind of a joke now. Um, so I think yes. what, what, what is occasionally a little intimidating for someone who comes from, say you, you were a biology major in undergrad and you're getting a PhD either in biomedical engineering or something similar, is CAD can seem a little intimidating, but that's fine. I think the, the amount of value that it can offer for anyone who's in a lab is so immense is to just give it a little bit of a try where if you're a student, you can get Autodesk Inventor with a student email. Um, it's a fantastic piece of software. Uh, I can't really recommend it enough. It's, it's very crucial. And there, there are plenty of other packages out there like SolidWorks that people like you to use. I've used that, I know you have. Um, but, but don't just let, if, you're, if your project is something like cell culture, and, and other types of testing, don't, don't think that you don't need 3D printing because if, if you have that tool in your belt, you'll actually start thinking a little differently about how you make your experiments. I, I, I would like to point out one thing. Uh, when you're learning stuff in a lab and your goal is to become good at bioprinting, let's say your professor has a 3D printer. If you learn 3D printing on the 3D printer, it's kind of fun. I mean, a lot of people find it really fun. It's a hobby for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but you can actually see what's happening there, and it's a lot more tactile. You can grab the print, look at what's screwed up or what's really great about it. Yeah. And it's a much better way of learning. It's very hands-on. Um, and it's, I think it's far faster to learn through that than it is to learn on a bio printer. Yeah. 